Your home for our Atlanta Falcons, Hawks, and Atlanta United. Your teams play here. Sports Radio 92.9, the game. Let's talk some Falcons with Michael Rothstein, ESPN Falcons reporter. And Michael, it's good to have you back on the show. Uh, celebrating a dub is always nice, but let's start with this trade. What are your impressions of what we're going to do with a guy like Van Jefferson? Uh, Mike was saying he thought they might trade for maybe a different position, not wide receiver. What do you make of this? Yeah, I mean, listen, this is, uh, it, it, to me, it's very similar to the Johnny Smith deal back in March, it, where they see something or someone that they believe could have value. And they can essentially get that player for next to nothing. Because remember, they traded, were, when you look at the Johnu trade, right? They traded, what, a seventh to New England? What's Johnny Smith doing right now? He is tied for the team leading receptions and leading the team in yards. You can argue whether that's a good thing or not. Different conversation. The Van Jefferson deal, what do you got to lose? A sixth round pick? Right. Well, a sixth round pick's a dart throw anyway. Right, and you're getting back a seventh, another dart throw of a pick. You're getting that in 2025. Okay, fine. If Van Jefferson ends up being a guy who can get you 500 yards this season as a receiver, that's a win for you. If he gets you nothing, you lost a sixth-round pick. That's the extent of it. Like, I, I see no downside in this deal. I, I see only the potential for it to work out if Van Jefferson plays well. And the last part of that, guys, is very simple. There is some familiarity there, not necessarily with Van Jefferson and Arthur Smith or Dave Ragone, but Van Jefferson's dad, Sean Jefferson. Longtime wide receivers coach now in Carolina. Guess where Sean Jefferson worked? Tennessee. Guess who he worked with? Arthur Smith and Dave Ragone. So there's some familiarity with Van Jefferson's skill set here and with kind of his makeup, and I think that's another reason why it made sense for this deal. There you go, Michael Rostin giving us the six degrees of Dave Ragone and Arthur yeah, Smith right hey, here I on Dukes I Bell. Can, you know. <laughs> now, I see, now, see, now I just need to figure out if I can connect Dave Ragone to Kevin Bacon, and I've won the day. <laughs> hey, man. Now, I, I was talking to Carl yesterday. There was so many things to be excited about, obviously, the amazing comeback and the great plays, but I, I don't want to make this into a federal case, but I thought Storm Norton did a really nice job. A dude who's been on a bunch of teams coming in for Caleb McGarry, especially in the pass protection side. I thought he played serviceably considering the situation he was put in. Remember, he's been around for all of, what, seven days? Right. Maybe that's what we're talking about here. Uh, I covered Storm Norton when he broke into the league because he was in Detroit, because all things these days Detroit, uh, out of Toledo. And, you know, the most the thing that stood out about him was his name, like Storm Norton. Right. It's a great name. It's like an all-time <laughs> name. Uh, but, no, I, listen, he started for a couple of years with the Chargers, at right tackle, so there is some starting experience there. He's, to me, what they had probably been looking for in a swing tackle when they cycled through Josh Miles and Jalen Mayfield. He's a guy that has some starting experience that you know you get, that you believe you can count on in a pinch, and that's I think what we've seen here. And we'll see how serious the Caleb McGarry injury is. I don't have any great information for you guys on that uh, at this point. So we'll see what that looks like. But if you have to start Storm Norton for a couple of weeks, that's not a bad thing. To me, it's, it's similar to kind of what happened at left guard last year when they had you know, the, uh, the Mary go left guard uh, right. when, when Elijah Wilkinson got hurt. And all of a sudden you had a bunch of guys fill in. Well, who's the guy who filled in the best? Well, Matt Hennessy. And what, what did Matt Hennessy have that, that other guys didn't? Matt Hennessy had starting experience. So I think we're seeing that with Storm Norton as well. And listen, if Storm Norton continues to play well, that's a good problem to have if you're Atlanta. We're talking with Michael Rothstein, guys. ESPN, he covers our Falcons. All right, let's talk about Ritter. Uh, 329 yards, touchdown. I thought it was great in the third and fourth quarter specifically. And the run game, we didn't run for over 100 yards in this game, which, again, we hadn't talked a lot about. But, Michael, I think it, it stresses more that there was more pressure on Ritter to deliver late in this game than, you know, if we had been running the ball effectively. Oh, without question. If they had been running the ball effectively, Desmond Ritter is probably not running, not running, not throwing for 329 yards. He's probably not even throwing for 250 yards because the combination of Bajan Robinson and Tyler Algier has been extremely effective up until Sunday. 
So uh, you sit there and say, okay, well, what does that mean? I don't know what that means, but what it did give you was the, I don't want to say the ceiling, because again, we're talking about a guy in nine starts, but it gives you the potential of what Desmond Ritter could be, which I think is what everyone was looking for. Well, what could this be? What could this look like? And you saw on Sunday what that is. Now, does that mean that's coming every week? Uh, heck if I know. But it, it showed, but it showed you the possibility. You know, you had, you had a Kyle Pitts who looked the healthiest. He's looked in a year and a half. Drake London was involved. Uh, Drake London, clearly the emergency quarterback. No, I'm kidding. I don't believe he would be the emergency quarterback. Uh, you know, you, you saw more guys involved there. But it, it, it leads you to think this, and I had actually asked Tyler Algier and Bajan Robinson about this. You yeah, asked Tyler this. I was like, well, you know, do you wonder what this offense will look like now if the run game does get going? And, and that, to me, is the big thing. If they can get both things going at once, then that's when I think we see the true breath of what Arthur Smith's kind of offensive vision for this group has been. We just haven't seen it yet, not close, because it's been if one thing is working, the other thing isn't. It's ESPN.com's Michael Rosting with us, guys, on the WaitFor.com hotline. Yeah, they did kind of go next level with the playbook. We saw the gadget play. Who knew that Drake London was left-handed? And uh, also, I, uh, I thought... <laughs> <laughs> and also, I, I like that play. The uh, It was kind of a, var- a variation on the John o. Smith leading the way uh, in the Packers game, which got him to first and goal. I love Mac. Ho- it was Mac Hollins leading the way on the scramble for the touchdown. Yeah, it, it was. There's another one that, that failed. There's a failed play in there. Kadero Hodge actually took a wildcat yes. snap, and that, that did not go well. But don't, here's the thing. I'm just going to say this right now. That's on tape now for every team. That Every team's going to have to practice that now. And at some point, I would not be surprised if we see Kadero Hodge back under you know, his shotgun again uh, at some point this season for a Wildcat type play. It might also give us that uh, elusive answer of who the third quarterback or the uh, emergency, emergency emergency quarterback right. if all three quarterbacks were to go down would be. Uh, it's how it's played quarterback for a year at Alpine State. But uh, you listen, Drake, by the way, Drake London with the left-handed thing, uh, so I asked him about that because I didn't know he was a lefty either, right? Like bad beat, beat reporter there. I didn't know that the guy who never has to throw the ball is actually a lefty. Uh, and he said, no, like that's really all he does lefty. Everything else he does is kind of right-handed, but he throws left-handed for some reason. Uh, and I was just like, okay, fine, ridiculous athlete. Move along with your day. <laughs> Michael, tell us about, tell us about the commanders, man. Um, they're up next. What do you think about this next game? And, you know, we talk about Ritter home versus the road and all of that. Fact of the matter is we got to string some wins together. Yeah, they do. A hundred without question. This is a commander's team that I thought was, was pretty decent. And then they ran into that well-known buzzsaw. That's the Chicago bears. I mean, they're, they're clearly <laughs> like, you know, I mean, come on guys. No, I, what they showed was that I think they're vulnerable in the secondary they put a ton of money and a ton of resources into that front. So you need another good pass protection game like you had against the Texans. If you don't have that, it could very much look like the Lions, very much look like the Panthers in the first half, and that will throw their entire offense out of whatever rhythm and sync they currently have because that defensive front is so talented. But it's one that – you know, that hasn't always been able to get home. Offensively, Terry McLaurin's their guy. You know, he's a great wide receiver. Sam Howell's looked good in stretches. There's, I didn't think he looked particularly good against Chicago. And he's another young quarterback. He, he's similar to Ritter, right? He has fewer starts than Ritter, but late-round guy in that draft class last year. I, you think he might be something, so you take him. You're giving him a chance to start. You kind of see what happens. I, I think that the two the two quarterback situations are very similar. Um, it's going to be another close game. That's the thing. We we have seen these games between these two teams the last two years have been very close. Have come kind of get down to the end. I remember Marcus Mariota uh, threw an incomplete, but it was an incomplete pass or a tipped interception. I forget what it was in Washington last year. It just was at basically in the red zone, and it was it didn't work out. And then the year before. The Falcons were up, and then Taylor Heineke, now Atlanta's backup quarterback, 
led Washington to a win in the, the final minute. So it, they've been close games, and I would anticipate it being as such. But the big key to me is going to be can they keep Desmond Ritter from having to scramble all over the place and just take sacks uh, because their defensive front's able to get going. That happens. It could be a real long day. Otherwise, uh, if Atlanta can keep, get their run game going, it you know it could be another win. Great stuff. Michael, thanks for joining us, man. We know you got to run. Busy, busy dude. We will see you up at Flowery Branch. Appreciate you stopping by. Hey, anytime, y'all. Take care. Michael cool. Rothstein, guys. Uh, and by the way, yeah, I mean, yeah. go. No, I was going to say first impressions on the commanders. Mike, they're not that good. I mean, the defense, you know, you always think of Ron Rivera as being solid defensively, but man, that that team really was exposed by the Bears now. I think you could do some of the things that uh, that we like to do now. We got we don't have DJ Moore, but we're seeing Drake London and Pitts get involved. I think Pitts is you heard Michael Rossing say is getting healthier and healthier, and you're seeing the results. So just a matter of us establishing that run. And I, look, with all due respect, Caleb McGarry, take your time and uh, and, and, uh, and and hope that and we, you know we didn't get a chance to ask him would we, would would, a, would an edge rusher be in our future if they, if there was like a situational guy and the price was right because we do have some money for a rainy day before holiday. Halloween, which is the trade deadline, because the only thing missing our defense. I'm not belly aching about the defense. The only thing missing though is the guy that can get to the quarterback consistent. We still we still don't have that with the older guys that we brought in. Well, remember now, they're not limited to moves. If something is there and it makes sense, I, I do not think. All right, here's where I don't think we, we don't do, Mike. I don't think we go out and break the bank on somebody in a trade. Um, that's too much. This risk reward thing. If you're talking about a guy like Van Jefferson. Um, and you feel like you have a connection and, and a relationship, that's different than rolling the dice on a guy and having to pay a lot of money down the road. I don't think they want to do that. I, I still think we're going to go pluck a guy off the tree, as you like to say, in the draft. But we're not limited. They could still make a move between now and the trade deadline if they feel mm. like we could go get another edge rusher or somebody on that D-line that could be a rotational guy that could help us get after the passer. I don't, I don't see that being out of the question. I don't. 